read down to verse number 7. Appreciate Sister Paige and all the work that she does with their children. Looks like Everly's moving in. <laughs> Amen. Annual chapter number three. Begin our reading with verse number one. And it reads as this, And Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together Together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all of the rulers of the provinces were gathered together into the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, that ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down at the worship it, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So we see several things that we're going to really preach from this entire chapter, a very familiar uh, chapter. Uh, but there's a lot of truths here that the Lord really opened up to me yesterday. And uh, I just want to share with you, if the Lord allow me for a few minutes on this thought, what fire reveals. What fire reveals, if you will, stretch forth your hands this way. Ask God to help us and anoint us today. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for the privilege that we have to be here. The lot has fallen for the preaching of the Word of God. I'm asking that you would add your blessings to the Word. I'm asking that your anointing would be applied today, for I can do nothing without you, but with you, by you, and through you, Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm asking to hide me behind the cross. Don't let it be my words I'm preaching at people this morning, but let it be your words preaching to people this morning, right where they are. God, you see where every individual is. It's not by accident or chance that we're here. But God, I pray that your truth, God, would prevail and triumph this morning in hearts and lives. Do a work that only you can do. Father, we're going to give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. The church says amen. amen and amen. Amen. If there's one thing that I've learned in this Christian experience is that fire reveals character. Nobody likes the fiery trials of life. But in them, it's, it's where we grow. It's there that maturation takes place. And it's then that our character is revealed. I learned a long time ago, never judge a man where he is spiritually on the mountaintop. But wait till he's down in the valley. That's when his true character is going to go to the top. For that goal, when it's tried by fire, it can look great on the outside. But gold is in its purest form when it's liquid. When the heat has been applied. When it goes into the furnace, that gold that looks great on the outside under the surface could be filled with impurities. It can be filled with fragments. It can be filled with, with things that, that could corrupt and that could diminish the value of that gold nugget. But when it's in the fire... All of those impurities will rise to the top. And it's then that the goldsmith can take a ladle 
and remove those impurities. He can take his instruments and begin to work on it. And when that gold is, is then uh, taken out of the fire and it settles, uh, that's when uh, the purification process has been taking place. Uh, it took the fire to reveal the true character of the gold. Uh, if we look at the definition of character, it simply means one of the attributes or features that make up and distinguish an individual. It's the character of a man that makes the man what he is. It's the character of man, character that, that takes place on the inside that may be hidden. There are uh, some people that are just as go good as gold on the inside as they are on the outside. And then there's another uh, group of uh, men or women that may look good on the outside, but their inward parts is full of corruption. The outside is just a facade hiding the lack of character on the inside. But when you give that character an opportunity to show itself, true character will always be revealed. I mean, you can't hide who you are. You can't hide what you are. Sooner or later, it's going to come out. We see in the Word of God that there were times that the fire revealed character of men. We know that it was by a fire that Peter denied Christ three times. The man that was with Christ, that saw the miracles, that experienced all of the greatness of Christ, when his feet, or his feet were put to the fire, fire revealed that true character and nature of Peter. It revealed a man that was with Christ, that had seen the power of Christ, but the power of Christ had not yet come alive on the inside of him. And when he was by the fire, Fire revealed that character and nature. But on the flip side, we also see when the Holy Ghost and fire came upon Peter that he didn't wilt under the pressure, but he stood and preached and 3,000 men were born again in Jerusalem. Why? Fire refined that character in his life. Was forever changed. Job, who was a perfect right and a perfect man, upright and one who eschewed evil, when he was put through the fiery test of life, his true character was revealed. Not as a man that would backslide and crumble under the pressure, but a man who, who lived up to the character that he portrayed. A man who was indeed an upright man and eschewed evil. When Isaiah saw the glory of God in the temple uh, and uh, cry, uh, the, the, the glory was uh, high and lifted up, he saw the, the glory of God. Uh, uh, it was then that he realized just how low he really was in comparison to how high and holy God was. Uh, and what was it? Uh, it was the fire, the coals off uh, of the brazen altar that was applied to his lips and changed him. Uh, God said, I see what you are. I see your character. Uh, but let my fire be applied to your life. Uh, I'll give you a new character. I'll give you a new nature. And it was then that Isaiah was sent out. So we know that fire reveals the character of men. In our text, we can see also that fire revealed some things. I mean, there are some truths in these scriptures that I want us to realize. Number one, I'm going to try to stick close to my notes this morning because as God started talking, I started writing and typing. And, and uh, if I don't, I'm going to keep you here past uh, uh, the time where uh, you, your dinner might be cold by the time you get home. So I'm going to try my best to stick to notes this morning. Amen. To help us out. But number one, I want you to realize that I revealed the character of a corrupt political system. A system, uh, as B.H. Clinton would say, that was so rotten that a turkey buzzard had to hold its nose uh, when it would fly over it. Uh, a system that was uh, uh, birthed in corruption. We read of the King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who made an image and he set it up in the plains of Dura in Babylon. And he called together all of the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the councilors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces and said, we're going to issue out an edict that all of the nation is going to bow down and worship my image. Now we know that Nebuchadnezzar is one of the Old Testament villains in the Bible. Twice he conquered Jerusalem. He destroyed Solomon's temple. He took the Jews captive, which is where we are at this point in time in our text for 70 years. He had them. In the land of, of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was one who was known as a ruthless ruler who would let nothing get in his way of subduing peoples and nations and tribes. He ruled land all the way from Egypt 
to present day Iraq and beyond. A great portion of the Middle East was uh, owned by the Babylonian Empire. But it was Nebuchadnezzar that used wealth from conquered people to uplift his own self, his own ego and pride. And it was by this he was able to build one of the seven wonders of the world. This man was a man full of pride who could manipulate through flattery and imagine himself on par with God, deserving of worship. Now it's one thing for a man to be lifted up in pride and think that he's on the same plane as God. But it's something different when the whole political system was geared around this fallacy. Notice Nebuchadnezzar from the king all the way down to the local sheriff was in on this scheme. From the top to the bottom, all of it was corrupt. All of it was, uh, was uh, just mass corruption. Instead of bucking the system, the political minions followed right along. So the fire in our text revealed the corruption of the government. Number two, it revealed the character of their culture. For you see, when the, the cry was issued out by the king, that when you hear music, the sound of the, the trumpet, the harp, the psaltery, the dulcimer, amen, people are going to bow down and worship my image that I've set up. And the Bible says in verse number 7, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all the musics, that all the people, the nations and languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Not only did this corruption corrupt the political system, but this corruption had polluted the culture of their land. To where what the king said is what they obeyed. <coughs> the culture of the people was to blindly follow a godless king. They put his words on the same level as that of God. The culture of the people was to blaspheme the one true God and to worship Baal. When you read commentaries of this, uh, different ones um, uh, say that this image may be uh, several different things. But there is a consensus among most conservative scholars uh, that this was an image erected to Baal. Now we know that, uh, that, that Baal was the, the Canaanite god. He uh, would kind of take on different um, forms based upon the different people groups of the world. Some worshipped him as different things. But Baal, in his inception, was the god of fertility and prosperity. He was the, the god that the, the, the pagan people would pray to and they thought that he would make them make their lands fertile so that they could increase crops. He was the God that they would pray to to provide riches and wealth so that their names may be known among the earth. You see, these people began to worship prosperity. These people worshipped a system that was birthed in hell that took the glory away from God and placed the glory on themselves. That's what their culture had become. And notice they used music to usher in worship for their God. Music in its inception was created for one purpose and one purpose only. And that was for the worship of God Almighty. Entire uh, cherubims in heaven were, that's why they were created to sing praises unto God, to sing uh, praises of honor and glory unto God. Uh, amen. And I can tell you anything less than that, uh, that, that uh, uh, than, what work, than what music was created for, the devil will assume it as worship. Because he's taken the glory away from God uh, and placing the glory on things uh, below God. Uh, they use music uh, to usher in the worship of God. Uh, amen. We can see we're dealing with the culture. The culture was to blaspheme God. The culture was to finally, blindly follow a godless king. And lastly, the culture of the people of Babylon were against the chosen people of God. For it says in Daniel 3.8, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. I looked up that word accused in the Hebrew. It means to denounce, to slander, to accuse maliciously. 
But it also means to chew on, to consume, to eat, and to devour. The culture of these people in Babylon were against God's chosen people. They wanted to devour them. They wanted to consume them. It was them that developed this plot and this plan. That if they're not willing to conform to what we are, we're going to kill them. If they're not willing to conform their beliefs to our beliefs, we're going to do away with them. So much for tolerance. Amen. They didn't want anything to do with tolerating the people of God. If they didn't conform, they wanted to kill them. Amen. We see thirdly things that fire reveals. Fire revealed the climate of the church. And while there wasn't per se a church in Old Testament Babylon, the Jews were God's chosen people, which is a type and a foreshadowing of the church that was to come. Right. Amen. In our text, there were many Jews in the land. There were many people who one time observed the law. There were many people who one time offered sacrifices unto Jehovah in Solomon's temple. There were many people here that knew the law of God, that knew about His holiness, that knew about His splendor, that knew about uh, His commandments and His law. But while they were in the land of Babylon, many compromised. Uh, and they picked up the customs, the trends, and the fads of the Babylonians. And it had come to the point uh, where in many instances you couldn't tell the Babylonians from the Jews uh, and the Jews from the Babylonians. They had gotten ingrained with the culture that was around them. And at the first opportunity, instead of standing up for Jehovah God, they bowed their very knees to Baal. The very knees that one time would bow in the presence of Jehovah was now bowing to a pagan entity. They were willing to go along to get along. They were willing to do what they had to do to fit in. As you look at what fire revealed, a corrupt political system, a corrupt culture, and a corrupt church, it doesn't take much spiritual discernment to see that there are striking parallels with us in our present day world. The Bible says to be not ignorant concerning the devil and his devices. It also says that there's nothing new under the sun. The same devil that they had to encounter in Babylon is the same devil that's out to get us. A man that's come to steal, kill, and to destroy and is using the same tactics against us and 2022 as he did in the land of Babylon some 600 years before Christ. Amen. We can open our eyes and see that the battle that they fought then is the same battle that you and I must overcome today. Number one, if we're going to overcome, we've got to un uh, 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 overcome a political system that has become unhinged. Amen. That it's no longer about the people. For the people. Amen. It's about whatever our politicians in D.C. can do to make themselves rich. Notice what Nebuchadnezzar did. He robbed from the poor to increase his own wealth. Amen. What's Washington, D.C. doing to us today? Absolutely taxing us to death. Amen. Keeping us under their thumb while they get in political office and become millionaires overnight. Say amen to me, somebody. Amen. It won't hurt my feelings a bit. Amen. Our politicians have pulled out the playbook of Nebuchadnezzar. They padded their own pockets and became wealthy at the expense of us. And in their own twisted minds, they have now put value of their words at or above the value of God's words. It was Mr. Jerry Nadler who some years ago when they were passing the Equality Act which was nothing. It wasn't even veiled. But it was a platform pushing homosexual and transgender rights. Amen. That was given rights to pedophiles. He said this, what any religion tradition describes as God's will is no concern of this Congress. In other words, let me paraphrase that and, and get it down to where you and I can understand it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a simple guy. That means we don't care what God has to say. We don't care what the Bible has to say. We don't care what biblical traditions have to say. 
that has no bearings on what we do in conference, in Congress. Uh, the same Congress uh, that was instituted, uh, I mean, years ago based upon the foundation of the Word of God, uh, that before they ever wrote a word uh, of the Constitution, spent days in prayer uh, to get the will of Almighty God, uh, I mean, has now become corrupt uh, to the point where they no value, uh, the very, no longer value the very Word of God uh, that their institution uh, was instituted upon. Uh, oh my God, help us. Uh, we're living uh, in a world with corrupt politics. Uh, amen. And our leaders, uh, amen, by and large, uh, amen, are corrupt in the very system uh, that they're supposed to be defending. It was a 5-4 decision by the Supreme Court, the highest law in the land, that changed what God viewed as marriage and said it's to be between one man and one woman that said Adam can marry Adam and Steve can marry Steve. They were spitting in the very face of God and saying that our words are more important in America than God's words. I can tell you God's judging it. Amen. You better get ready. God's going to deal with that. In fact, it was the Democratic National Convention where an entire arena booed the very God that you and I serve. I mean, all of this thing tells us, folks, the same parallels they were dealing with in Nebuchadnezzar's day. We're dealing with our day. A political system that has become unhinged. A political system that's out trying to pad their own pockets and do what they have to do to get rich and have no concern about the will of the people. I got a yeah and I help them, Lord. Amen, I'll take it. It's going to get better. Just hang on with me. Amen, I'm preaching what fire revealed. Fire revealed corruption of politics. Fire also reveals the corruption of our culture. Not only is our politics in a mess today, our very culture has been birthed and breathed out of hell. Amen. Yes, sir. When you have executives in Disney, I listen to the audio messages of the closed door executive session. Sicken me to hear it. But the very executives of Disney that's making decisions for what many of our kids follow today. One writer, one of the executives said, I'm so happy that what I've hid in the shadows for years, I'm now able to bring out to the forefront and put it front and center. She said, what I've hidden in the back scene for years, I'm now able to bring to the forefront. And she said, I'm happy to say that going forward, over 50% of our projects and our movies going forward is either going to be with an LGBTQ message or it's going to be pansexual, meaning that it or, or asexual, that it's just going to be basically anything goes. That's disturbing to me. I have a problem with that. Amen. A culture. Amen. They're after our kids, folks. They're after our children. The music on the airways today. The music that they watch. Uh, there's many people that are blindly, many of our children and our teenagers uh, that are hearing that, listening to the lyrics of songs, uh, watching uh, in, in, in the movies. Uh, and then they don't realize that there's a warfare and a battle that's being waged for their very soul. Uh, and they don't realize uh, that it's not just about Peter Pan uh, and, and uh, uh, Mickey Mouse anymore, uh, but it's about an agenda birthed in hell uh, that's how to consume and how to destroy Troy, when she had what that that troubles me that they become so blatantly as to say what they're wanting to do, but what troubles me even more about what they put in the background for years that nobody else has paid attention to. Subconsciously, there's been a plot out for many, many years that we've not been awakened to, but now the light is coming on. Now we're able to see for ourselves that we have got a culture that is corrupt, and in the same way, culture corrupt corrupted them. It's doing the same thing to us. Corrupt culture. Subconsciously don't realize the agenda that's being pushed. Moms and daddies, 
You better be on guard. You better be on guard. You better be paying attention to what's going on. Notice what they use to usher in worship for their God. I shared with you earlier, music was created in heaven for the glory of God. They took what was designed for the worship of Jehovah and used it for the worship of their God. Can I tell you that much of secular music today is the same exact thing. The devil is collecting that and assuming that is worship. In a recent concert, I saw the video and it troubled me just as much as Disney. But in a recent concert, Miss Beyonce was singing her songs and dancing on the stage. And at one point in time between songs, she said, I want everybody to stop what you're doing right now and lift your hands all over this arena. I want to feel your energy. Listen, I don't raise my hand for any man but him. Amen. Yeah. Hey there's only one man that deserves us to lift up our hands and praise. And that's God. And yet our culture is becoming so entwisted and engrossed in sin and godliness uh, that they're wanting to take the very thing that was designed for God uh, and heap it upon themselves. Uh, have you noticed lately, uh, before I stopped watching the news, uh, even on Fox News, uh, when some tragedy or some school shooting would take place, uh, some of the commentators would say, uh, uh, the, my thoughts and my energy is with you. No longer is it, I'm praying for you. Yeah, you'd have some that would say, I'm praying for you. But others would say, my thoughts and my energy, amen, are with you. Amen. Energy, what is that? Amen. Worship and praise. Amen. And, and the awesomeness of God's glory that was one time, amen, for Him and Him alone is now being spread out in different ways. People don't want your prayers anymore. They want your energy. They want your vibes. Amen. They want your good aura that is a power. You. I can tell you when crisis hits, uh, amen, and when it affects culture and it rains on the just and the unjust, uh, they don't need your energy. Uh, they don't need your good vibes. Uh, they don't need, uh, amen, your good vibes. Uh, they need a man or a woman that can get a hold of God uh, and say, I'm not going to be engrossed uh, in this culture. Uh, I know uh, wherein my street lies. Uh, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills uh, from which cometh my help. Uh, my help uh, comes from the Lord. Uh, the maker of heaven and earth. It's time that we rise above the corrupt politics and culture of our world and fasten our eyes back upon the matchless one, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God, mighty in battle. Hallelujah. And give Him the worship that's due His name. Hallelujah. You see, corrupt. All this is what fire revealed. Corrupt politics. Corrupt culture. And sadly, a corrupt religious system that governed the hearts of the people. They all, these Jews, one time, staunch worshipers of Jehovah. If you would have asked them when they were dwelling in the days of Glory of Solomon's temple, would you ever bow down to Baal? Absolutely not. But when they found themselves in Babylon, Jehovah had to go. Jehovah had to go. Much of the church does the exact same thing. It's not about Him and His glory. But what can I do to give myself more power, more authority, more money. If they have to compromise, they'll compromise. They'll come to church on Easter and Christmas. They may even put a couple of dollars in the offering plate. But why don't we, the next business social and everybody else's social drinking, they'll pick them up a glass. Oh, say amen to me. Somebody's all right. Amen. Going along to get along. 
Forget the verse wine is a mocker, strong drink, raging, and he that is deceived thereby is not wise, which literally is interpreted as a fool. Yeah. We'll throw all of that out. If I can get in good with my boss, hey amen, I, I, I can work my way up the ladder. I mean, we look at these Jews and we think how, how foolish, how crazy they were. Well, much of our church culture does the same exact thing. Yeah. They worship Baal, the golden image of prosperity and fertility. Amen. We're sacrificing our kids on the altars of, of prosperity every single day. Yeah. Amen. If, 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 if I've got to do this or do that, uh, amen, forget about uh, amen, the future generation and forget about them. Uh, it's easier to, to do what I need to do to get the next dollar than it is to have my church, my family in church uh, every night of revival. Uh, every night of uh, church, I'm going to be there when the doors are open. Uh, amen. Many people aren't following down. And worshiping uh, a golden image that's been erected. Uh, but they're doing the exact same thing in principle every day. Uh, amen. Worshiping uh, prosperity. Worshiping uh, fertility. Anything that they can do to increase themselves. That's what they're doing. Fire reveals that. Fire revealed corruption politics in culture. And also, sadly, the church. But can I tell you, there's a few other things that fire revealed. And I told you it's going to get a little bit better. We're there. Amen. Thirdly, fire revealed the character of these three Hebrew children. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. In Daniel, there were three. There were three boys who purposed in their heart that they loved their God more than a wicked king. That they love God more than a corrupt political system. That they love God more than a godless culture or a compromised church. In Daniel chapter number 3 it says, And there were certain Jews who thou hast among the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They served not their gods, nor worshipped the golden image which, which thou hast set up. You see, there were three boys who were willing to stand up when everybody else was standing down. There were three men, just like Moses, that would rather themselves to be counted amongst God's people than to dwell amongst the tent of the ungodly. There were three men that was willing to stand up when everybody else was standing down. Amen. Can I tell you in today's world there is a remnant church made up of believers that still standing that has not bowed her knee to Baal. That has not bowed to the corruption of our culture. The corruption of the political system or even the corruption of what's much of what calls itself Christianity today. But the fire of oppression and adversity is turning up. But like these boys we have made up our minds. We're not going to stand down. We're not going to turn around. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to wave the white flag of surrender. We're not going to go alone to get alone. But we're going to stand flat footed based on the word of God. Oh hallelujah. And though heaven and earth may pass away. And then we're going to be anchored in the one thing that never will. And that is the infallible, the inerrant word of God. Oh hallelujah. Let Washington D.C. do what it wants. Let this culture go to hell in a handbasket. Amen. In the final analysis of these things, the church is going to be triumphant. The church is going to reign supreme. And you and I will reign, hallelujah, forever and forever with Christ. Don't back down. Don't back up. Amen. But stand firm and anchor down on what you know to be true. It's what these three boys did. So we're not going to bow to political politics. We're not going to bow to culture. We're not going to bow to religious systems that have gone awry. God has always had a remnant. And God always will have a remnant. The remnant at times may be small. But I can tell you that remnant is powerful. That remnant oftentimes don't realize the power that they have. Not in their own strength, but in God's. You see, there were some things that transpired with them. The same thing is going to transpire with us. If you're willing to take a stand, you will face the fire. There's no way around it. 
You try to stand up and live for God, culture is going to ridicule you. The same way that they try to devour them, they're going to try their best to devour you. Politics ain't going to care a thing in the world. They're going to issue every edict and mandate that they can to shut us down and to shut us up. The church system may mock us and ridicule us and say it's old fashioned, no foggy, and you don't have to live that way anymore. Amen. Fires of adversity may hit us on every side. Amen. We've got to realize that some things are worth facing the fire over. Oh, hallelujah. Some things in this life are worth uh, facing fire over. Amen. In our text, these three boys. Uh, amen. This Nebuchadnezzar rose up in his rage uh, and said, Why don't you hearken to my words? Uh, paraphrase, why don't you serve my God? Uh, amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, O king, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Meaning, uh, we are very careful to answer you uh, and what you're going to and what we're going to say. Uh, amen. We, uh, we, we've put our lives on the lines for the word that's about to come out of our mouth. Uh, if it be so, our God, uh, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Uh, and He will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. Uh, but if not, but if not, we're believing God that He's going to deliver us out of this trial. We're believing God to deliver us out of the fire. But if not, but if not, we're not going to back down. Amen. We're not going to wave the white flag of surrender. Amen. God is able to shield us from the flame. But if not, we're going to go to heaven and we're going to be with Him for all of eternity. Friend, that is the mindset you must possess. Amen. When you get diagnosed with cancer, amen, and it's it shakes you to the core. Hey Amen. You've got to have that same determination. I believe God is going to heal me. He is all powerful. But if not, I'm still going to praise Him. Oh, when there's zero dollars in the bank account and you don't know how the bills are going to get paid, you're going to stand firm and you're going to trust God that somehow, some way, He is going to provide. But if not, I'm still going to worship Him. I'm still going to praise Him. I'm believe even God that my family is going to come back together and my home is going to be restored but if not I'm still going to come to church and lift my hands and worship Him that is how you've got to approach the fire that is how you've got to approach the flames standing on God's word He is able but if not I'm still going to serve Him anyhow We believe God's able. Yes. But if not, Brother Scott Rowland, one of the greatest men, amen, just a great friend, loved the Lord, loved God, a worshiper. It wouldn't take much for him to lift his hands. Tears begin to flow down those cheeks. Just loving, worshiping God. Got diagnosed with cancer four years ago. They buried him yesterday at his funeral. But he had a but if not mentality. He never wavered. He looked cancer right in the eyes. Never blinked. Never backed down. Amen. And about a week ago, still believing God for divine miracle. Amen. He said, honey, I'm believing God's going to heal me. But if not, here's what I want. Laid everything out. Amen. Didn't back down. Didn't compromise. But looked death right in the face. Eyeball to eyeball. Said I'm still going to worship God anyhow. I'm still going to love God anyhow. And if He don't heal me. Amen. I'm going to go to the other side. And I'm going to be with Him throughout all uh, of eternity. Uh, amen. That's what the church needs in this hour. A but if not mentality. No matter what comes my way. I'm still going to worship Him. Still going to love Him. You see their character was revealed their faith in God was bigger than their fear of the fire. Their faith in God was bigger than their fear of the fire. They said, we may burn, but we won't bow. B.H. Right. Oh. Clinton and somebody asked him, talk about the faith of the Hebrew children. They said, man, what kind of faith that is? Amen, faith that kept them from burning. He said, no. He said, it wasn't faith that kept them from burning. It was faith that kept them from bowing in the first place. And by proxy of that, God kept them from burning. Hallelujah. Amen. Faith says I'm standing for God. 
And God will take care of the rest. They didn't necessarily know what the outcome would be. They just knew that they weren't going to back down. Amen. The fire revealed the character of the true church. And can I tell you this? That fire will reveal the true character of this church. Yes, we're going to face some tribulations. Yes, we're going to face some trials. But I would to God. Amen. That every single one of us would have that same mentality. That when all of the people were bowing down to Baal. When all of the people were bowing down to culture and to politics. There was three that said, I'm not backing up. I'm not backing down. Amen. We're putting our faith and trust in God. And we may be small in number. But we're mighty in God. Hallelujah. I'd rather have a house of 50 that has that mentality. Than 5,000 that's bowing their knee to Baal. And offering it as worship unto Jehovah. It's not about us. It's about Him. Amen. We may be small. But bless God. We're mighty because we have an audience with Him. We see the character of the three boys revealed. If I reveal that. Whew. I might just shout a little while. Lastly, fire revealed the character of our God. Amen. Hallelujah. Fire revealed the character of a political system going to arrive. It revealed the character of culture. It revealed the character of a church. By and large that it was backslid. But it revealed the character of those three boys. And it revealed the character of our God. Amen. Where he was able to prove that he'll never leave us, that he'll never forsake us, that he'll never abandon us, that he won't allow us to go through the fire by ourselves or alone. Amen. He won't send an angel uh, or a winged potentate to come down and do his job. Uh, but Brother Daniel, by his spirit, uh, he's right there with us. Uh, every time those three Hebrew boys took a step uh, toward the fiery furnace, uh, God Almighty was taking steps with them. Uh, hallelujah. Not abandoning them in the crucible of their life, uh, but in the darkest hours, uh, he proved himself as a friend uh, that sticks closer than a brother. Uh, a friend uh, that would go with us all the way, even to the end of the world. World. He's a God that's not moved by fire. He's a God that's not scared of the fire. As a matter of fact, He's got feet like brass and eyes like fire. Why? Because He stood in the fire a many a time before. And if He's done it then, we can have faith and assurance that He'll do it now. That's His character. That's who He is. Never leave us, nor forsake us. You know the story very well. Nebuchadnezzar orders the fire to be ramped up seven times hotter. That didn't scare them, and that didn't scare God. Character rose to the top. Not a bunch of weak-kneed weaklings, but three mighty warriors. Hey, man, said, this may be the day I die, but I'm going to die with him. Though he may slay me, yet will I trust him. Notice some things about God. I've got about six things. I'm going to go through these very quickly. The same God that led them to the fire was the same God that led them through the fire. If God has led you to this season of adversity and difficulty, then you can rest assured God will lead you through this season of difficulty and adversity. Yea, though I pass walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God never intended for His children to stay there. God never intended for His children to stay in the fire. But this season, God, amen, is going to bring His children through the fire. God did not allow an exit ramp to keep the fire at bay. But He allowed them to be thrown in the fire itself to prove once and for all that He's greater than the fire. Oh, hallelujah, I could shout this morning. He's greater than the fire. Amen. Notice that the fire did not bring about their destruction, but instead it brought about their deliverance. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar orders the fire to be ramped up. He orders them to be bound and thrown in. Twice in Scripture, before they were thrown into the fire, they were bound. When they threw, were thrown into the fire, the Bible says that they fell down bound. But after a few minutes went by. Nebuchadnezzar asked the question, 
I don't know if he was intoxicated. I don't know what his mental state was. I don't know if he had bifocals or if he had transition lenses. But he took off his spectacles, rubbed his eyes, put them back on. Said, boys, did we not throw three men into the fire? And they said, yeah, king, we did. He said, below, I see four. Hey, man, loosed. And the fourth looks to be the Son of God. They were bound when they went in. But when God showed up, amen, He loosed them right in the middle of the fire. Oh, hallelujah. God may not keep the fire at bay. God may allow you to walk through it, but He's not going to abandon you. And the very thing that the world and the devil is plotting for your destruction could be the very thing that God uses for your deliverance. When the bands that the enemy has put on your worship, when the restrictions that He's put on your praise, He's says I'll shut them up I'll silence them up but right in the middle of adversity the bands fall off and you're loose by the power of almighty God oh hallelujah God can turn what was meant for your destruction into an agent to bring about your deliverance the fire loosed them notice that the deliverance came not after the fire but in the fire God didn't wait until after they passed out of the fire to say, boy, let me loose those bands. No, but it was right in the middle of adversity that God performed His greatest work. Oh, hallelujah. It was right in the middle of the fire that He loosed them. Amen. You don't have to wait till the fire is over to shout the victory. You can have victory in the middle of the fire. You can have victory from God Almighty right in the midst of the fire. Amen. After the fire, God brought them through. They were loosed. And after the fact, there was no evidence that the fire had even touched them. Their hair was not singed. Their clothes were not burnt. They didn't have third degree burns. And get this, there wasn't even the smell of smoke. You don't even have to be touched by fire for people to know that you've been around fire. Why? Because fire carries a scent. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. The, the, the smoke will get in those clothes. Not to bring up bad memories. Brother Eddie and Sister Kim's house as we were over there helping them. Weeks, months after the fact, that fire smell was still there. Amen. Amen. Why? Because it always leaves an after effect. But with God, not only is He able to keep you through the fire, He's able to shield you from the effects of the fire. Amen. To where you're able to come out. Amen. And nobody even knows that you went through it. Amen. Because you've been kept by the power of God. He proves that His power, that His provision, that His person, and His protection is greater than the fire. Can I tell you this morning, right now, God is greater than the fire that you are experiencing. Oh, hallelujah. God is greater. Greater is He that's within me than He that's within this world. If God be for me, then who can be against me. We're made more than conquerors through Christ who love me. That includes the fire. When you're able to conquer the fiery trial of your life, you'll find that God's protection is there and there's not a mark upon you. There's not even the smell of smoke. Some things are just God. He's able to keep us. Hallelujah. But I want you to notice this. The same fire that God delivered the Hebrew children in was the same fire that destroyed the ones who threw them in. You see, when Nebuchadnezzar said, ramp that fire up hotter seven times, put more fuel on it, put more gas on the fire, make it hotter, do all that you can. Throw more fuel on it. Get more wood on it. Pour more gas. Seven times hotter. The fire was so hot that when they bound those three Hebrew children, threw them into the fire, the fire consumed them and they died. The same fire that God delivered 
the children of Israel from was the same fire that destroyed the captives. You see, God turned the tables on their captivity. God turned the table on their captivity. He delivered them in the hour of the fire, but He allowed the fire to consume the enemy of their soul. Amen. I believe within my heart, Amen, God's about to turn the tables on the devil. I believe with all of my heart He's been plotting our destruction. He's been plotting our demise. Amen. It was Genesis 15 and 20 when Joseph's brothers thought an evil thought and plotted a scheme against him. Amen. But he said what you meant for evil, God turned it around for our good. What happened? God turned the tables on the enemy. What happened in the book of Esther when Haman built a ghetto to where he was going to hang Mordecai and the Jews? God turned the tables on the enemy and Mordecai hung on the same gallows that he had built. No, not God's people, but the enemy of God's people. Amen. I believe God is about to turn the tape this morning. You might be in the fire and the flames may be lapping all around you. Amen. But God is going to turn it this morning the same way He did for Joseph, the same way He did for Mordecai and the three Hebrew children. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changed. He is not changing. And He's never going to change. If He did it for them, hold on to the promise, beloved. He will do it for you. And He'll turn the tables on the adversary of your soul. Ain't that what's going to happen in the book of Revelation? All of the enemies of the hell is going to be plotting to overthrow God and destroy Him at the battle of Armageddon. Amen. But God's going to turn the tables on the enemy and He's going to come back and we're going to come back with Him riding on white horses and He's going to destroy every nation that has arisen to overthrow God. But then there's something else He's going to do. He's going to take the beast and the false prophet and even the devil himself And He's going to throw them into a lake of fire forever and forever. The same fire Brother Daniel, He's trying to destroy you with and He's tormenting you with. On that day, the tormentor is going to become the tormented. And for all of eternity, the tables are going to be turned. Hallelujah. And they're going to be lapped up and destroyed. Don't lose heart this morning. Don't lose hope. Our day is coming. God is going to turn the table and we are going to shout the victory. Kirsty, come help me. I'm done. One more thing. I want you to notice after God delivered the children of Israel, the, the three Hebrew children for the flame, Nebuchadnezzar's eyes were opened. And the Bible says that he elevated them, he promoted them to positions of authority. And said that the God of these three Hebrew boys, they are the true God. If you give up in the flame, there will be no reward. But if you're willing to endure the flame with God, our promotion day is coming. Our elevation day is coming. I'm not a prosperity preacher that will teach you your promotion on the job is coming. Or a check on the mail is going to be coming. Amen, I wish they'd sit down and shut up. Amen, and let a real man of God pick up a microphone. Amen, I'm not here telling you any of that junk, but I am telling you one day, our promotion day is coming. Amen, First Thessalonians 4.13. Amen, there's going to be a day, hallelujah, when the trump of God sounds. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we, which are alive and remain, we're going to experience our great getting up day. Our promotion and our elevation is coming. Amen, that's going to be the message uh, to a political system going awry, uh, to a culture uh, that's going to hell, uh, and a religious system that's falling asleep, uh, that that remnant uh, you poked and made fun of uh, for all those years, uh, and then that's going to be uh, that's going to be uh, our vindication day uh, when we're promoted uh, in the face of every adversity, uh, in the face of every enemy, uh, in the face of every crooked politician uh, when Nancy Pelosi is left, uh, but the church rises up. Bless God, we will be promoted. Stand with me all over the building. I'm done. What fire reveals, you may be here in the fire this morning. 
You may be lumped into the church that's facing the fire this morning. Amen. I've come to tell you don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Amen. The character of our God is about to be displayed. Amen. When He delivers you right in the midst of the flame, brings you out without even smelling like smoke. And someday soon and very soon, our promotion day is coming. Our revelation day is coming. When all of the world is going to see there's something to those old fogies. There's something to that church. There's something to, amen, they might have looked different. They might have acted different. Amen, but they're gone. Hallelujah, our great getting up day. Amen, if you're here and you're lost, amen, I want you to come and get saved. Amen, if you're here and you don't know God and you need to be born again, there's no day like today. Today is the day for your salvation. You don't have to endure the fire and the affliction that is known as sin. There's deliverance from that in Jesus' name to the child of God that's consumed with the adversity and the fiery trials of this life. Amen, I'm coming to build faith in your heart and life. Don't give up in the flame, but possess a but if not mentality and watch God work. Watch God move. Step out of your pew this morning. Meet me in this altar. You can come raising your hands. He's Oh my God, He's here. He's here. He's here. Hallelujah.